All right, so I guess we can, we can get started. It is 12.31, almost 32. So before I start, I just have a question. Um, how many people here are from outside of the library, non-library employees? Oh, wow, vast majority. Well, on behalf of the library, welcome to YRL. Welcome to my presentation. Uh, those of you from the library, on behalf of yourselves, welcome. Um, so to begin with, I'd like to start off by um, telling you guys a small little story um, about some breakthroughs that happened recently um, last year. In September of 2014, a rocket was launched from Cape Canaveral, Florida, and its destination was the International Space Station. Part of the cargo of that rocket was this 3D printer. It's the first 3D printer that was sent into space. Now, in December of that year, um, there was another first. NASA was able to uplink uh, the first part to be printed in space. So this was a design that didn't go with the 3D printer. This was a design that um, was necessitated by Commander Butch Wilmore, who lost that ratchet, floated away somewhere in the space station. And so he needed a replacement. And instead of putting it on a rocket and shooting it up there, they just had the same team that designed the 3D printer. They designed a replacement part and they printed it out for him. This is actually that ratchet, not the same one that, <laughs> that, that he has. It hasn't made its way back home yet. Um, but what's nice about this is that you can download this. Anybody can download this. You have access to a 3D printer. You too can print it. Um, unfortunately, our 3D printer is not the same quality as NASA's, so, so ours doesn't really match it, but it's still the same, uh, same part. Yeah, it's, yeah, close enough. You get the job done. Um, so, uh, following that, a year later, um, another momentous event, at least in my life, um, I was sent to Euromol, to Dusseldorf, Germany, from September 22nd through the 25th, on behalf of the library, um, to kind of gain some knowledge as far as 3D printing in the industry. Um, Euromold is the World Fair for mold and pattern making, tooling, design, additive manufacturing, and product development. So just a quick aside, additive manufacturing and 3D printing are two terms that are used interchangeably to mean pretty much the same thing. Um, in my experience, 3D printing is referred to most commonly in the desktop world, <coughs> excuse me, world, and additive manufacturing is something you use because you want to sound smarter or more industrial, or, you know, more powerful. Um, so there were two themes um, at Euromold that I borrowed from, shaping the future of 3D globally and global visions of the future. So I'm going to be honing in on the second theme of Euromold and breaking it down into kind of three parts, um, global visions and the future. So hopefully by the end of the talk, um, you guys will be convinced that additive manufacturing is a big deal. It's just getting started and that actually the library is the home for 3D printing at UCLA. So global, um, worldwide additive manufacturing industry. Obviously, the United States is not the only country in the world that is developing and improving and researching additive manufacturing techniques and technology. So what are some of the other countries in the world doing? Um, visions. Where is the additive manufacturing industry today? What, what are the visionaries um, of the industry producing and improving upon? And then, of course, the future. What do we have to look forward to? What does the future of additive manufacturing look like? So before I get into the current state of the industry, um, I kind of want to ask a question. Why, why now? Why are we just now talking about 3D printing? 3D printing was actually invented back in the 80s. That's when the first patent was uh, introduced for uh, uh, a type of technology called fused deposition modeling. It's the patent that kicked everything off. Well, um, two words can explain why. Uh, expired patents. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, what you're looking at is a, a list of all of the patents that have expired in just the last two and a half to three years with regards to 3D printing. Um, a lot of the uh, expired patents that have propelled the industry forward are the we're called the foundation patents, um, the ones that invented this technique, the foundation patents for three different types of 3D printing, uh, FDM, SLA, and SLS, and I'll get into those right now. So FDM printing is, um, stands for fused deposition modeling. There we go. Well, 
Well, I'll skip ahead a little bit, but whatever. So the first one, FDM, is called Fused Deposition Modeling. And um, that short video there that you're seeing is actually our 3D printer that we have in the library right now. Um, it's basically a, an extruder that you feed a filament of plastic into. Um, in our case, it's PLA filament, uh, biodegradable filament. And in, in PLA's case, the extruder heats it up to 215 degrees Celsius and then lays it down layer by layer by layer to construct the three-dimensional object. The second type of uh, 3D printing that has um, its foundational patent expired is stereolithography or SLA. And basically that uh, uh, works with a photosensitive liquid resin that solidifies when it's exposed to high intensity UV light. So if you look closely at the bottom of this video, you can see those little flashes of light. That's the laser. It's kind of a cell laser similar to what you have in your Blu-ray player. It doesn't have to be very powerful. Um, it's uh, basically firing into the resin to solidify the layers, layer by layer to construct the object. And it kind of goes, the build plate goes in the opposite direction of the extrusion printer. It's kind of like Terminator uh, riding in all of the liquid goo. Um, and then finally, the last type is not a desktop 3D printer uh, yet. It's uh, selective laser sintering or just laser sintering or SLS. Um, this is the type of 3D printing that uses a much more powerful laser than the SLA type. And it works with a very fine titanium powder um, that the laser then uh, sinters and solidifies layer by layer to create titanium parts. Um, those are the, the, the printers that produce, obviously, the aerospace titanium parts and actually medical implants. We'll get into those a little bit. Um, so you can see from the growth trend of 3D printing, um, with the expiration of those patents in the last three years, it's pretty easy to see the correlation between the growth of the industry and the expiration of the patents. Um, the patent that kicked everything off back in the uh, 80s actually expired in 2008 or 2009, um, which spurred companies like MakerBot to design their own 3D printer and kind of really kicked off the desktop 3D printing craze. So that's kind of a snapshot of uh, how we got here. Um, so for the sake of time, I obviously can't talk about every country in the world that's working with 3D printing. So I picked um, just one part of the world um, that has the largest potential for 3D printing, and that is, of course, Asia. Uh, massive market, massive potential, and they're already doing a lot of things. And the pioneer um, in that market is, of course, China. China has already um, invested over a billion dollars into the 3D printing industry, and a lot of that money is going not to the industrial sector, but actually into the educational sector. The government has pledged that they're going to put a single 3D printer in each one of their 400,000 elementary schools across the country, um, which is a pretty big deal and a pretty heavy investment from their perspective to really bring up the next generation of engineers and designers. And they've already broken records. I mean, they have the largest metal parts for aerospace. We've probably already seen um, on the news, we've read about the 3D printed houses or buildings that they're doing. And then of course they have uh, the cheapest 3D printers on earth. And um, so, so next up in, in Korea, they're relatively small right now. They do only have a 3% market share of the total global industry, um, but they are seeing an ad, uh, annual domestic growth rate of about 30 to 40%. And similar to China, they're also very heavily invested in educating their population with 3D printers. 60% of all additive manufacturing machines in Korea are in colleges and universities. So last year, um, the Korean additive manufacturing industry only really generated $42 million, but it's expected to grow to $316 million in just a few years. So finally, um, India is a pretty unique case because they were pretty late to the game they didn't adopt uh, additive manufacturing until the late 90s, so almost uh, 20 years from when the technology first uh, surfaced. And since that time, though, they've really um, kind of cornered the market as far as jewelry is concerned. 80% uh, of all jewelry that's manufactured with additive manufacturing techniques is made in India. So a lot of uh, what's happening now is they're designing these really intricate rings and designs, and they're making the mold pattern by 3D printing, and then, in, and then they just injection mold mass produce on a, on, a, on a massive scale. But to get that intricate design manufactured at first, it requires additive manufacturing, 3D printing techniques. 
and a lot of um, a lot of those uh, the result of that industry basically is that um, 30 Indian startup companies um, have surfaced both industrial scale um, but also a couple desktop uh, 3D printers. So that's kind of a snapshot of the biggest players in Asia. There were other countries represented there, like Australia, uh, New Zealand, South Africa, Japan. Um, but there's just there's just too much information for me um, for this one talk. So um, after that, of course, we got to talk about us. What about us? Um, our industry is is the largest by far um, right now. Uh, in 2015, it's expected to generate five and a half billion dollars this year alone. Last year in 2014, 140,000 individual manu additive manufacturing machines were sold, almost double the number of machines sold uh, in the previous year. And surprisingly, at least it surprised me, the vast majority of those machines are still industrial machines. So even though we're having this massive desktop 3D printing craze, it's still vastly an industrial uh, uh, industry. Um, within those industrial machines, that 86% of 140,000, the type of machine that's seen the largest growth is the metal additive manufacturing machines, the laser sintering machines. They're seeing a, a lot of growth and development. And of course, one of the biggest proponents of that uh, type of 3D printing is NASA. Um, NASA recently test fired, you're looking at the videos there of the test firing a new rocket fuel injector that they designed. The rocket fuel injector they designed has 40 individual spray elements. Now with it, traditional manufacturing techniques like CNC milling or injection molding, that rocket fuel injector consisted of 163 individual parts. With additive manufacturing, it's only two parts. So fewer parts means fewer chances for failure. And additive manufacturing, the manufacturing technique, also allows for a freedom of design that's unprecedented. So the engineers were able to design this really complex geometric flow pattern that swirled hydrogen and oxygen together, um, that combusted at a record 20,000 pounds of thrust, 1,400 pounds per square inch, and six, it fired at 6,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So uh, if you're not an engineer, those numbers sound impressive because it sounds like a lot. Um, but this next number is, is well known to everybody, and that's the cost. Um, NASA is constantly fighting for, uh, uh, for a larger budget, and so any way that they can save money is a pretty big deal. So this rocket fuel injector with traditional manufacturing techniques costs $220,000 for just one. 3D printing it costs $20,000 for two. So there's a massive savings there, um, largely due, I think, because of the reduction in the number of parts. Um, you just hit a button twice and you've got your rocket fuel injector. So to kind of change gears a little bit, um, to go into 3D scanning, um, 3D scanning is still considered part of the uh, additive manufacturing industry. There are 3D printers, desktop 3D printers that have built-in scanner uh, scanning technology. In my opinion, uh, the scan 3D scanning technology is still lagging behind 3D printing in terms of desktop availability. Um, that isn't to say there aren't very, very high quality and excellent scanners available. It just means that I'm guessing you and I wouldn't be able to afford them. They're in the five-figure range. But they have been around for a while. Um, they're mainly used for reverse engineering. And um, believe it or not, this is actually a 3D scanner. So the end, that point right there, the, the, the ball, that's what the engineer designer uses to uh, basically draw points on the outside of the object. And then the computer extrapolates from those points and creates the 3D object from that. But it's kind of laborious, it's kind of cumbersome, and so the most exciting developments, in my opinion, are in the handheld 3D scanning devices. This is still not, it looks like it's desktop availability because it's nice and small and portable, but it's still around $10,000 for it. But it's really nice. Um, it's a USB uh, scanner, handheld scanner, and as you can see, it's, it's scanning him in a matter of seconds. So in, in a matter of 60 to 90 seconds, it can do a complete scan of a person. Um, the software that comes with it is actually able to combine those two scans into a single scan. And it produces a watertight STL file in color. So let me go back there for a second. The STL file type, um, it stands for a lot of things for some reason, but mostly it stands for standard triangle language and standard tessellation language. All that means is that just like Word uses a docx file, 
or Excel uses an XLS file, 3D printers use STL files. Um, and the watertight aspect of it means that the software is able to uh, fix any mistakes in its own scan. So if the model um, that it produces has any holes in the skin of the model, the print would fail. But the software is able to fill those holes automatically below a user specified size. So if the model is supposed to have holes, the software is not going to correct what it should correct. Um, and I did mention that it produces scans in color. Um, there's me. Um, it's so detailed you can even see what bag I had my shoulder uh, slung over my shoulder. So anyway, um, it, it does produce a color scan. And those of you familiar with 3D printing know that STL files do not carry in any information about the color of the object. It's one of the shortcomings of the file type. But this is important because the industry currently has a committee um, of, made up of a very various different industry experts, and they're coming together to try and update the industry standard. The STL file type has been around since the 80s, so it's kind of outdated. And so they're looking to incorporate things like color, because you are seeing 3D printers that can print in full color now. Um, so it's nice to see that the, the, the hardware is kind of staying ahead of the software curve, kind of like in the uh, computer industry. So to switch gears back to um, 3D printing, additive manufacturing, a lot of what we see in the news is um, about medical implants, 3D printed, printed implants, and rightfully so. Um, a lot of us have heard about these titanium implants, like this sternum or ribcage that was recently transplanted into a patient. Um, I'll spare you guys the videos, um, but one of the keynote speakers there is a doctor who specializes in cranial maxillofacial uh, implants. And um, suffice to say that um, he basically in, in, in implants an entire replacement of the lower mandible into a patient. So this lady came in with a very serious bone infection on her uh, lower mandible, and it required removal of the entire bone. So the doctor worked with um, this company called Zillock, and they designed and printed uh, a custom fit, a patient-specific lower mandible that would only fit into her uh, her head, her mouth. Now, obviously, this has a natural shape to that particular patient. And so that natural shape means that it fits perfectly naturally into the existing bone structure of the patient, um, which dramatically reduces recovery time and dramatically reduces the chance of rejection. The doctor claimed that um, this lady, and they had footage of it, when she woke up from this surgery, she was speaking. And three days later, she was discharged from the hospital. Ordinarily, what we've been doing is adapting patients to the implants that we're giving them. So one size fits all, this is gonna hurt, your body's just gonna have to kind of get used to it. But with 3D printing, we can now adapt the implants to the patient, which is a big deal, yeah. Any idea of cost? I don't, no, he didn't, he didn't mention that. I'm, I'm assuming it's, it's up there, yeah. Um, but it was in Europe, he's a European doctor, so maybe, Maybe it was free. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't I think that's true? <laughs> um, so another uh, Star Trek-like uh, thing that we hear about is 3D printed organs in the medical field. Um, I'm sorry for the meme, but we're, we're not there yet. <laughs> um, the same keynote speaker that was doing the titanium implants estimates that in about 10 or 15 years, we're going to see partial organ transplants. So that's a, that's a heart valve or part of an esophagus or maybe part of a kidney. Not an entire organ, but getting there. So how, how do you 3D print an organ? How do you 3D print tissue? Well, the biggest challenge um, that faced doctors was the, the need to think in three dimensions, right? Normally, doctors look at a, a single slice of a CT scan or an uh, image of an x-ray or uh, through a microscope on, on a petri dish or something like that. They're not really used to working in three dimensions. How do you create a network of capillaries and, and veins to sustain that, that block of tissue? So researchers at the Wyss Institute in Harvard, Wyss Institute is just a medical research institute at this little fun place called Harvard. Um, they, they've developed a material that is solid at room temperature and then liquefies when it's cool. And they've called this material fugitive. And so what they've done with, uh, with this material is they've developed a 3D printer that has four individual print heads. 
One of the print heads delivers this fugitive ink. One of the print heads develops collagen, and the other two print heads de uh, deliver uh, fibroblasts, which are the uh, cells that make up the connective tissue in your body. And so they built a block of tissue using the collagen and fibroblasts to make up the body tissue itself. And then the fugitive ink in place of the capillaries and veins. Once the block of tissue was finished, they cooled the tissue down to liquefy the ink and they gently sucked it out of the block of tissue and it left behind this really intricate intravenous structure of capillaries and veins. More remarkable still, when they injected endothelial cells into that network of, of capillaries, um, endothelial cells are the cells that make up the blood vessels in your body. The endothelial cells actually multiplied and grew and basically took over that, that network of capillaries and veins, effectively creating actual capillaries in the block of tissue. And using that network, they uh, gently pumped oxygen and nutrients through it and were actually able to sustain that block of, block of tissue for weeks at a time, which was unprecedented. So that's kind of how uh, 3D printing organs is, is, is coming about, but it's still far-fetched, still a little bit in the future. Yeah. Anything you're aware of in ophthalmology? Ophthalmology, not that I'm aware of, no. Um, I would think that that has a lot more to do with being able to 3D print a nerve or, or is that? Well, no, I was thinking cornea. Yeah, yeah maybe. I don't know. Uh, the big challenge with with this kind of 3D printing, with a lot of 3D printing, is not necessarily the 3D printer itself, but the materials that you're de developing. You know, um, so the future of ink is a pretty important step in that direction. So um, I had, I didn't really mention it in the implants section, but. Um, ceramics is actually looming really large on the horizon in a lot of different industries, including the medical industry. Um, I believe that in the future, all uh, implants that were titanium are going to be ceramic um, so that people can enjoy TSA scans uh, like everybody else. <laughs> what, you're, what you're looking at is not 3D printed medical grade ceramic. It's basically just 3D printed pottery. I couldn't find any footage of um, the ceramics being printed because it's, it's really kind of still on the on the horizon. But what the researchers are calling these materials are bioceramics and biobinders. And they're made out of silica and calcium phosphate. And the remarkable thing is the body, that tricks the body into believing that the object is actual bone. So using the bio uh, binders and bioceramics, they're actually doing true bioprinting. So they're creating a scaffold out of this bioceramic material. They inject stem cells into that bioceramic material. The stem cells grow and fuse with the scaffold, effectively creating bone. So it's no longer a, a titanium jaw bone that you have to attach to uh, the, I don't know what it's called, whatever it, whatever it attaches to, but it's, a, it's, it's now a ceramic replacement that actually fuses with exist, the existing bone structure and is bone in all, for all intents and purposes. Um, so that kind of gives you an idea of the advances necessary for material science. Um, and, and also it's not just um, um, ceramics, but also there's a big improvement in composite-based additive manufacturing. So uh, carbon fiber, fiberglass, and Kevlar are also being used with 3D printing. It's kind of difficult to explain how you print in 3D printing carbon fiber. So I, I was able to find a video that um, explains it a lot better than I could. So let me go ahead and play that for you guys. Impossible Objects technology enables additive manufacturing of fiber reinforced composites for making production parts. The CAD model is sliced into layers and each layer is converted into a digital bitmap. Layers are printed onto fiber sheets using a clear fluid and thermal inkjet technology and a high-precision positioning system guides the inkjet heads. Polymer powder is applied to the fiber sheet, adhering to the printing fluid. Excess powder is removed, leaving behind polymer in the shape of the bitmap. This process is repeated for all of the layers of the part. Sheets are stacked, heated to melt the polymer, and compressed to consolidate the part to its designed height. Through a mechanical or chemical process, the uncoated fibers are removed, revealing the part. So, 
So the company Impossible Objects, they boast that their composite parts have a tensile strength of 19,000 to 23,000 PSI. And to put that in perspective, um, aircraft grade aluminum starts at around 23,000 uh, PSI for its tensile strength. And carbon fiber has a higher strength to weight ratio than aluminum. So the aerospace industry is very interested to see once these composite parts are improved upon and can reach that tensile strength on a regular basis, we're gonna see a lot of replacement uh, parts from aluminum to composite. And it'll lower the, dramatically lower the weight of the aircraft and of course save on uh, fuel costs. And then those savings will be passed on to the consumer. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> So what does the uh, future of additive manufacturing look like? Um, it looks pretty big. So from the desktop world, this is somewhat of an old graph, but what this is is monthly submissions to a website called Thingiverse. Thingiverse is a free online repository where you can upload your 3D objects for other people to download and print. Sort of like this, except NASA has its own website. Um, but if you, or, if you or I wanted to design something and share it with people, we would upload it to Thingiverse. Um, and like I said, it's a little bit old, but back in uh, 2012, um, at the very, on the very right there, um, in November of 2012, Thingiverse was seeing almost 30,000 unique submissions uh, a month from users. And that's just in the desktop community, desktop community, which is still only 16%. Last year was only 16% of additive manufacturing in total. So what is gonna um, drive future growth? If, if we're going to continue on the same trend of quadrupling in five years, the industry will generate uh, over $20 billion uh, just here in the United States um, in 2020. So what's gonna propel that forward? How are we gonna continue to quadruple? Uh, not to sound overly simplistic, but I believe two things, software and hardware are gonna drive those two things forward. And specifically, uh, two innovations from two companies, um, Autodesk and Hewlett Packard. So we'll start with <coughs> software from, from Autodesk, CAD software or computer aided design. So what you're looking at is the highest resolution photo I could find, sorry, of Dr. Patrick Hanratty in 1957. He was considered the father of CAD. He's the guy that invented CAD software. And if you look closely on the screen, I think you'll see what the big problem is with this picture. And, and the problem is, is that some of us, if not most of us, can look at that screen and recognize that as CAD software. I didn't even know 50s had software, let alone software that resembles software of today. You wouldn't recognize a computer from the 50s. So if you recognize software from the 50s, it hasn't undergone too many improvements, unfortunately. Um, one of the uh, keynotes made a very strong case that CAD software shouldn't stand for computer-aided design, but should rather stand for computer-aided documentation because the computer isn't designing anything. It's simply documenting the inputs of the engineer, of the designer. It's not doing any designing itself. And so that's what Autodesk is trying to change. Um, they've got a software that they're calling within. Um, technically, it is CAD software, but they're calling it generative design software. I have a video that I'll play in a second, but in a nutshell, that basically means that the engineer or the designer gives uh, parameters to the computer with which to generate design. So the engineer is no longer designing per se, they're just giving use cases and parameters and constructs for the computer to then design the part. So the only video that I could find of the software within was very long and very boring and it would have no sound. So I had to trim it down. So because I had to trim it down, I wanted to take a screenshot, which is what you're looking at right now, a screenshot of the final part. Because the clip that I have for you doesn't show you what the final part looks like. So this is the, the, the video. So the part, as you can see, is not solid. Instead of being completely solid, it's designed by the computer, designed a, a lattice work structure in, on, in the interior. Now that is incredibly intricate and incredibly difficult, if not impossible, for a human to design. I mean, it's possible, but the amount of time it took the computer is far less than it would take um, even an expert designer. And that color scale that you're seeing there is the computer now stress testing its own design, again, based on the parameters or the use cases given to it by the designer. 
and you can't really read it up there, but he or she just clicked optimize components. So keep an eye on the lattice structure right here. Boom. So the computer designed the lattice structure. The computer then tested the lattice structure in the relevant use case scenarios. And then the computer optimized its own design um, in, in specific places based on its own stress testing of the parts. This would have been impossible to do uh, without a computer that can do that. I, mean, it would take, it would, it would, I guess it would have been possible. It would have just taken years to do instead of minutes. Um, so it's, it's, it's pretty exciting to see that now Autodesk is kind of bringing about this new way of thinking as far as CAD software is concerned to actually harness the vast computing power that we have to actually design parts for us that we, in ways that we wouldn't have thought um, possible or even efficient. So next up is HP. And um, I should have mentioned this before Autodesk, but I'm not uh, necessarily advocating one company over the other or saying you should go buy their product or whatever. In the case of Autodesk, I'm saying they're doing something nobody else has done before and it's gonna change a lot of things. And in the case of HP, it's the same thing. The technology that they're introducing is, is something new. But more importantly, I think, is that they're a $100 billion company with 300,000 employees. Everybody knows who HP is. So for them to become invested in 3D printing is a pretty big deal. The largest 3D printing company right now is only about a billion dollars in assets. So harnessing HP's resources is going to you know, drive innovation forward. And so the technology that they've developed is called multi-jet fusion. And they claim it solves one of the biggest problems facing 3D printing today, and that is speed, production ready speed. So in a test of printing a thousand gears, HP claims their printer did it in just three hours versus 38 hours with laser sintering uh, aluminum printers or 83 hours with um, material extrusions, these FCM printers. Now we don't, we can't independently test this because this printer's not out on the market yet. It should be available sometime next year. Um, it's not a desktop 3D printer, it's an industrial 3D printer. So the way the technology works is very similar to an inkjet printer and very similar to the composite printer that you saw earlier. In fact, um, you can get this technology, multi-jet fusion technology, in their industrial 2D printers. It already, it's already on the market. So they harness that technology and applied it to 3D printing. So remember in the composite video, um, sheets of carbon fiber were laid down and then the print head deposited powder and then a fusing agent. In this case, instead of a sheet being laid down, the, the, the print head lays down that material. The print head also lays down the uh, fusing agents and then applies the necessary energy to fuse the agents to the material. And it can deliver all of these materials at a rate of 350 million drops per second which is a re produces a resolution of 20 microns, which is 0.02 millimeters. The resolution just means the height of each layer. So the, the smaller the layer, uh, the higher the resolution, the more intricate, uh, more fine the details. So more exciting, at least in my opinion, than the hardware of their 3D printer is the materials that they're advertising um, that come with it. So they're also developing this material that um, their prints are going to be made out of. And I've got another video here to kind of explain that um, a little more succinctly than, than I could. HP's multi-jet fusion technology enables the world to realize the full potential of 3D printing in fully functional parts. HP transforming agents could control texture, friction, strength, elasticity, electrical properties, thermal properties, and more. Imagine a single part with stiffness optimized in some areas, elasticity in others, or wear resistance and friction customized where needed. Or imagine printing a complete electromechanical module in a single 3D build without requiring further assembly. HP's full system solutions could allow inventors to design and build assemblies that have form and function surpassing what can be imagined and manufactured today. The list of future possibilities seems endless. So every time I watch, every time, uh, every time I watch that video, I can't for the life of me figure out why HP 
shows a video that looks like it was made in the 90s to introduce this really brand new technology. Um, but just to kind of reiterate what they said, one of the most common questions I get asked kind of tongue in cheek is, do you 3D print a 3D printer? <laughs> no, um, not yet. But with this kind of a technology, this is a big step forward um, in accomplishing that. So a single 3D printer can, in one single part, print different properties, electrical conductivity, stiffness, flexibility, all in one single print at the speed which HP advertises. So again, it's, it's an exciting product. I'm not supporting the company necessarily itself, but I think you'll agree it's kind of a, if you know anything about 3D printing, it's kind of a big deal uh, what they're introducing. So to kind of wrap things up, I want to throw some more numbers at you guys. Um, the global manufacturing industry, that is not just 3D printing, but all manufacturing throughout the world, generates $12.8 trillion a year. Currently, worldwide, additive manufacturing only occupies $11 billion of that $12.8 trillion. So given everything that we've talked about, all the industries that are going to be changed by additive manufacturing, uh, the aerospace industry, um, the uh, uh, material science industry, the medical industry, software, desktop 3D printing, and all the industries that I didn't really have time to mention, uh, like fashion or food, given all of those different industries, how many people here think additive manufacturing is going to grow to encompass less than 5% of worldwide manufacturing, less than 5%. Between 5 and 10%, 10 and 25%, some more hands, 25 and 50%, and over 50%, a lot of hands there. Okay, so just to put things in perspective here, 2% of $12.8 trillion is $256 billion a year. 5% of $12.8 trillion is $640 billion a year. And 10% is, of course, $1.28 trillion a year. So whatever the case may be, it's clear that there's a lot of growing left to do um, in, in the additive manufacturing industry, a lot of innovation left. So, so what? <laughs> so what? Why, why are you here in a library, in a library conference room, listening to a library employee talk about 3D printing? What the heck does this have to do with UCLA Library. Well, recall the theme that we um, talked about earlier, global visions of the future. Now, UCLA by its very nature is a global institution. Nobody would argue that. And so by extension, the UCLA Library is also a global institution. Now, the library is the campus nexus where all of the disciplines that we talked about are studied and developed and improved upon. I strongly believe that part of the library's role, a very large part of the library's role, is to provide the campus with the resources it needs to meet the challenges of today and, and realize the vision of the future. And if we have an opportunity to introduce 3D printing for the first time to students and faculty, that's a pretty big deal. And not only that, and more importantly, I think the most important thing in doing so, we actually free up other departments to invest in more advanced 3D printing technology. We're the campus's springboard. We facilitate innovation, we facilitate research, and we facilitate progress in every discipline. Thank you very much. So, questions? Yes. Does the library own a 3D printer? We do, yes. We have um, a pilot program. We have a single uh, MakerBot 3D printer. If you are interested in printing something, um, contact the library help desk. So it's helpdesk at library.ucla.edu. Um, the pilot program is open to submissions right now. We're hoping to get more so that we can kind of have a more robust uh, permanent service. Yeah. Was there any discussion at Euromo about a uh, safeguard that needs to be built in to protect against how shall I put it? Uh, nefarious use of these yes. technologies? Yes. Yes. So um, I kind of regret it because you know the way the conferences are is you go to room A or room B for whatever talk. And there was a talk on intellectual property law, and it sounded really boring, so I didn't go to it. I went to a, a different one. I caught the tail end of it, though, and it seemed like most of what he was talking about was 
intercompany uh, relationships. So how do you protect your intellectual property from other companies that are trying to pretty print the same thing? So the short answer is, I don't know. The long answer is probably not because there are so many unanswered questions. Um, most governments aren't agile enough to incorporate something like 3D printing into their uh, law books. Um, most of you have heard about the guy who's trying to 3D print guns. Well, from my understanding, there's only a, a few, one or two parts in a gun that actually makes it a gun. And those are the parts that are illegal to manufacture on your own. You can make your own handle, you can make your own barrel, it's just too there's only a few parts that actually turn that piece of metal into a gun, and those are what's illegal to produce. And the law covers all known types of manufacturing, except 3D printing. So um, there are questions like that. There's, of course, intellectual property considerations as well. Um, but those are just questions that time, time will answer. As far as the library is concerned, um, most of what, well, all of what we do right now is kind of go through me. So. There hasn't been any illegal 3D printing, I promise. Um, our printer wouldn't be able to print the gun part anyway, I don't think, so it's probably no. Um, yes? So you put out your open call to faculty and students to submit yeah. proposals. What kind of requests have you got? It's a good question. Um, I, the biggest project and the most exciting for me was actually an archaeological project. So over the summer, there was a display um, in the lobby of YRL where um, we displayed a 3D printed ruins of a site called Puma Pumpu in Bolivia. And these undergraduate researchers took uh, 19th century journals that had these measurements of these massive stone blocks from these 19th century explorers. They took those measurements, created 3D mo uh, models of them, and then printed them all out. And so that project then turned into, okay, so now what? We, we have all of the existing blocks. Let's see, let's see if we can reconstruct the ruins of what it actually looked like. And they did. Um, and then they were also able to start hypothesizing what missing parts looked like, because not all the stones were there. But it's, it, once you start assembling, it becomes very clear this block looks a lot like that block that is half missing. So we can just kind of build the rest of it that way. Um, there have been, of course, plenty of engineering uh, students, chemistry students. Um, they, they've been refining their design of a, a chemical reactor. They explained it to me, um, I'm not a chemist, so uh, basically it's just like a, a tube with channels that is supposed to keep the two uh, gases separate until they're ready to combust at the bottom. And so it's, that's kind of difficult to machine. And so they've been working with me on 3D printing that. There's also a lot of students in DESMA in the, and, and TFT, the theater and design schools. Uh, Props departments um, usually do set designs, and they they usually have three. From what from what they told me, they have three different iterations. The very first iteration is incredibly small, made out of paper, like a little smaller than like a dollhouse. Then you scale it up just a little bit to the dollhouse size, so that you can paint it and you can see what the object looks like with paint. And then you actually build the life size object. So we're learning that we fit into the the second phase there. The first phase. Is so small and so intricate that our, our 3D printer just it doesn't it doesn't work very well. Um, but that's just part of the, the learning process, right? And it's it's also design limitations. The students aren't used to 3D printing, so they're designing parts the way they would normally without considerations for the limitations of the technology. Um, and then architecture students um, putting their their models and stuff. There's there's been a lot of interest, a pretty diverse interest. The medical uh, community. Um, the Brain Mapping Center has these little custom-made plastic mouth guard things for rodents that they do CT or MRIs in. And when the rodents wake up, they generally bite down really hard and break that little plastic piece, which costs like 100 to $200 per. And so um, the guy had an engineering background and designed his own version of it, and then he 3D printed a bunch of those for him. So. What's yes. What's the typical cost of a 3D print, like of a set or something? That's a good question. So um, for, for this type of 3D printer, the uh, FDM printer, the MakerBot that we have, their filament comes out to be $50 for a kilogram, which breaks down to be about $0.05 cents a gram. So this would cost less than a dollar in materials to print. Um, other types of materials, obviously, like powdered titanium, I don't know what the going price is of that. 
Um, but uh, sterile lithography printers are also available in a desktop model. They are a little bit more expensive, the, the, the resin that comes with them, but they also, the, the, the benefits of having a, a laser printer are, are kind of worth the cost. They're higher precision. They don't have as lim any limitations as far as uh, support material um, and stuff like that. So inexpensive. Oh, a good example of that. So the, the ruins of Puma Punku, um, he printed the vast majority of those using Architecture's 3D printer. Architecture has a plaster 3D printer that is very labor intensive, um, but the end result is basically, it's much higher resolution than ours and it's, and it's made out of stone, basically. It feels like stone. Um, it's much more expensive though, that material. The entire ruins that he printed out um, cost him about $1,000 out of pocket for all of it. And I've estimated on the, the file sizes that he, or the files that he was giving me, it would cost the library about $80 in materials to print the same, same, same stuff. So it's cheap. Yeah. Is this um, service subsidized by the library? Is there a direct cost to users? No, there's no direct cost to users right now. And, and it's a aside, pilot program. what's that? Because it's a pilot. It's a pilot program, exactly. Uh, we don't have, we're not set up to charge anybody for it yet. Um, but aside from that initial investment of buying the printer, which was only about $3,000, the only upkeep that we've been doing is buying more filament, which hasn't, hasn't been a lot. So um, fractions of fractions of a penny if you had to trace it all the way down to the students. Yeah, go ahead. Um, what about the library landscape in general? Because it seems to me that public libraries have also been really agile mm -hmm. in, in purchasing, like LAPL has done it, Purchasing 3D printers for their communities as well. Um, how do you see the, the library landscape right now? That's a good question. So one of the first challenges is where, right? If we're going to have all these 3D printers, where are we where are we going to put them? Because um, they're not small. They're you know the ones that we're looking at are, are about this big. Um, so that's the first question, and the second is yeah, how how do you how do you start up a service that is going to grow to service of 40,000 students on campus. So what we're hoping is that we can generate enough interest to demonstrate the need of the service. That's kind of why I'm doing this presentation. That's why we've opened up the pilot program uh, to students and faculty. I wish I could go to faculty and say, put me in your curriculum because we will definitely be able to print what your students come to us with. But I can't yet because we only have the single printer. We do have, um, purchase requests in, in work to uh, to buy more 3D printers so that I can start going to professors and faculty and, and really starting to integrate this kind of thing into the curriculum. Um, because the big challenge is, is, again, getting people to think in terms of, of 3D printing. Has there been good examples of that at other universities where they've embedded that into the curriculum or have done any sort of uh, there are examples of like these maker spaces, right? And so it's not, not for us, it's not just 3D printing, it's the same with them. So we have um, a laser etcher that we're probably going to incorporate into this kind of a maker space, large format printing, um, just kind of creative tools for, for students. There are plenty of examples around uh, the, the country of these kinds of maker spaces. Whether or not they've been successful in integrating into the curriculum, I'm not sure, but I do know that they are successful in the sense that it's the service is being used. So, yeah. Do you have, um, do you have any plans to try to invest in more of the um, scanning, the, the 3D scanning, which which is, as, is, as we found out, is right. a bit limited. Limited, yeah, the, yeah. So actually, um, the Center for Digital Humanities has um, a desktop scanner that is way better quality than, than our scanner. It's currently being used in Egypt to scan uh, relic, relics and artifacts in the field. But we've partnered with CDH numerous times and um, I can very easily see if it's not in the field that we can open up use or, or work with the Center for Digital Humanities to have access to that scanner. As far as us having a 3D scanner in our like makerspace kind of area, as long as it costs ten thousand dollars, I don't see that happening in the foreseeable future. I'd rather spend that money on getting more three D printers so that we can have that service up and running. But yeah, 
Uh, do you have any software of the Autod uh, AutoCAD variety in your center? Not on the uh, click image, but there is um, Autodesk 360 is a uh, free CAD software for students and faculty. Um, there are plenty of uh, free design softwares like NetFab Basic or even Autodesk 123D. There are a lot of uh, free CAD design softwares that you can you can get. We do have on the Click Image uh, software called Rhino, which is um, also CAD software. So it's out there. Yes, Emily. We have a question from online from Rhonda Super. And she wants to know, can the library serve as a place to bring together resources and folks from different places on campus to write a focal place for a makerspace service? Yes. Um, you probably didn't see this, Rhonda, but when, when we started, I asked people to raise their hand if they were outside of the library, and the vast majority of the people attending right now are outside of the library. Um, so, yeah, I think that... That is going to be, in my opinion, that's going to be the main focus of, of the management of this lab. It's not going to be the technical knowledge to maintain these 3D printers. They're, they're pretty easily maintained, but it's going to be the outreach, going to these different faculty members that don't know about the technology and certainly don't know that it's available in the library. Um, so yeah, it'll be a challenge, but I definitely think it's possible. And um, I was wondering if Doug could talk about the 3D Printing Expo that we held almost exactly a year. Almost exactly a year ago to this day, yeah. So when I first, one of the first jobs I was given when I was starting um, here was to write a proposal to bring a 3D printing service into the library. And that was it. <laughs> I didn't know, I didn't know how to write a proposal, first of all. Um, secondly, there was no budget. There was no way of telling me where this 3D printing service would be held. Um, we didn't know who would use it. Um, and so what we just, what we did was we ended up having a 3D Expo Day to kind of to showcase the technology. And the turnout was actually surprisingly good. Last year we had about 176 um, people turn out for that event. A lot of people in this room are probably um, as a result of that, um, that Expo Day. So I met a lot of people there from various different uh, departments that are very much interested and seeing the library have a 3D printing service. If, if all it would take is to have a faculty member be a faculty partner or sign off or something like that, we would have had the service up and running months ago because there is that interest um, out there. So. Are you planning another expo? We should, I think. I think we will. Um, not this year, it's a little too late for that, but. Um, I think I definitely think we should, yeah, in the spring, especially especially if we get the green light and purchase more three D printers, because once we have more three D printers, that's that's going to be the main main drive is to to let people know to kind of spread the word, and, and we all know that, that just emailing people doesn't always work, so that's why the Expo Day and things like that is is, is a much better way, at least in my experience, to do the, the kind of outreach that, that is needed. Any other questions online? Is anyone looking into corporate partnerships? So, um, not on an official level. Um, we have been working closely with MakerBot um, because of several reasons. If, if, if you were to ask me to recommend you a single 3D printer for you to use at home, nine times out of 10, it would not be a MakerBot, but if if you're looking to create a service that is scalable with tons of different 3D printers, um, it would be MakerBot. They're the only company, in my experience, that has executive support. They have uh, Ethernet ports attached to their 3D printers. All of the models they use use the same detachable extruder head, so if that gets clogged, you just remove it, send it back, and have a replacement. Um, so there's no official corporate partnership in, in the works, but we have been working very closely with MakerBot um, to, to kind of get this service up and running. They actually came and sent two representatives to the expo last year. Um, so they're, they're very much, yeah. I'm just wondering if the, a CD, a 3D printer library has, can you print the color? That's a good question. Yeah, so 
this type of 3D printer um, just prints in the color of the filament. And we, there are a, a, a very a large, wide range of, uh, of colors for the filament, but it doesn't blend anything. Um, in order to do that, it would require two 3D printers, and since you're dealing with plastic, uh, two separate uh, extruder heads wouldn't even be able to blend the plastic. So there are 3D printers that print in color, even blended color. Uh, those are very expensive still. So to, to print this in two different colors, you'd have to pause the job somewhere in between the finish and then just replace the filament, and then you'd have a two-tone object. Lauren. To follow up on her question, though, does this uh, particular filament accept paint readily? It does. Yeah, it's, it's pretty porous. Um, so it, it, you can paint it. You can file it. Um, it responds well to, to glue as well, super glue. We, used, we printed a whistle. Um, that didn't whistle because it was too porous, and so we just used Elmer's glue to fill up all the holes, and it worked perfectly after that. So, yeah. Uh, just uh, well, I meant to ask you this earlier. What if you if you recall, you said that that handheld scanner uh, that you showed in the demonstration was like around ten thousand dollars. What do you remember? What brand that was? Artec 3D, I think. Um, Doug, if you email me, I, I can get you uh, sure. other lists. Okay. I, off the top of my head, I don't know, and I don't know if that's the best one. It was just the only one that scanned mediums. So that's why we <laughs> We have a follow-up question uh, from the corporate sponsor question. So do we have any, are we looking into corporate sponsorships with manufacturing corporations that might benefit from 3D printing and with whom we could participate in R&D? Um, that's a very good question. Um, that was one of the pie-in-the-sky dreams that I had when I went to Euromold, was to meet some sort of company like that. Um, I met the head of 3D printing from HP. He's the one that gave the keynote about their upcoming project. Of course, he was swamped afterwards, but I did go up to him. I did give him my business card saying, you know, if you want to have a partnership, you know, uh, come talk to us. <laughs> Um, I haven't heard anything from them yet. Um, there's, there's nothing on the horizon. But I, I do believe that um, some other schools on campus, like the engineering school, um, they would benefit uh, from a, a partnership with a, a 3D, 3D printer manufacturing company. Um, there's a club on campus called 3D4E, 3D4 Everyone. And um, they've actually been donated a 3D printer by a company called Artec. Uh, the, the printer's called Zeus. It, it can scan an object and then 3D print it all in one go. So they, I mean, there are partnerships like that um, that are developing, but nothing specific to the library in the works. The partnerships kind of that we're developing are with relating to the service. So the ruins of Puma Pumku, we're currently um, in the works of partnering with the site museum in Bolivia to reprint all of those blocks and then send them to Bolivia so that the museum there can have this display that we had. So those are the, the, the kind of partnerships that, that, that we're developing. Anything else? Oh, all right, well, thank you very much.